My dearly beloved in Christ, today on the second Sunday after Epiphany, we have the wonderful gospel relating the first public miracle of our Lord, his changing of water into wine. And there are many applications or reflections we could make upon this gospel, but I would like to concentrate on one in particular, and that is the unique intercessory power of our Blessed Mother. Notice that our Blessed Mother, observing that the wine had failed, perhaps there were far more guests who came than the couple anticipated. At any rate, Our Lady noticed their embarrassment. And here we see how our Blessed Mother is on the lookout. She watches over us, her children, and often comes to our aid before we even request her assistance. And that is what happened with this couple. She turned to her divine son, and she simply said, they have no wine. Now we can see in those words that she wanted him to do something about it. She wanted him to relieve the embarrassment of this young married couple. But our Lord simply replied to her that his time had not yet come. The timetable, the schedule, we might say, of when he would begin to work his public miracles had not yet arrived. Nevertheless, our Blessed Mother was not deterred, was not disappointed. She simply turned to the waiters and said to them, do whatever he tells you in a way of saying, dear Jesus, whatever you decide, that's fine. But she obviously wanted him still to work a miracle. And what is amazing here is that our Lord worked this miracle at her request, even though the hour arranged, determined, had not yet arrived. And in this we see the influence of our Blessed Mother over her Divine Son. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, in his book, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, quotes from a number of fathers of the Church about our Blessed Mother, but one quote sticks out in my mind, and I believe it was St. Bonaventure who said this. And he said, All things, Mary included, are subject to the empire of God, and all things God included are subject to the empire of Mary. Meaning that our Lord cannot refuse a request of his mother. First of all, because he knows that she would never ask him for something that would be opposed to his eternal will. But also because his love for his mother is so great. His gratitude to her. His sense of indebtedness to this sinless woman from whom he took his own human nature. That as all human beings love their mother, we can imagine, multiply that a thousandfold, a millionfold, and think of the love that Jesus has for Mary. And so he is only too happy to accommodate her requests. This gospel is a good scriptural reference for you to use when speaking to a non-Catholic who says to us, who says to you, you Catholics have too much devotion to Mary. They fear that somehow we're taking away something that belongs to Jesus, that we're taking away the honor due to him by our prayers, our rosaries, our piety towards our Blessed Mother. But they fail to realize that we go to Mary to lead us more surely to her divine Son. The old Catholic saying, to Jesus through Mary, applies here. And St. Louis de Montfort tells us that our Blessed Mother and devotion to her is because she is an easy, short, sure, and perfect way of attaining union with our divine Lord. We go to our Blessed Mother not as the ultimate goal of our devotion, but as a means of leading us to a greater union with her Divine Son, with whom she is so closely united. 
So again, use this gospel. When you are asked by a non-Catholic, why do you Catholics honor Mary so much? And of course, we are also fulfilling the prophecy made by our Blessed Mother herself in the Magnificat, when she said, after Elizabeth praised her, Our Lady, inspired by the Holy Ghost, said, From henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. I once was told by a woman, a convert from the Baptist religion, she was talking about her upbringing as a Protestant. And she said somewhat almost resentfully, she said, they, meaning the Baptists, they held the Blessed Mother back from me. They kept the Blessed Virgin Mary away from me. And what's beautiful is this woman has such a tender piety to Our Lady because she realizes what she was deprived of. And she realizes what a beautiful thing devotion to our Blessed Mother is. When our Lord was hanging from the cross, he turned down and he saw there St. John, the Apostle, the Evangelist, the only one of the Apostles to be present at the foot of the cross. And he also saw there several holy women, especially his own mother. And he turned to St. John and he said, Son, behold thy mother. And to Our Lady, behold thy son. Now by those words, our Lord was entrusting the care of his mother after his death to St. John. But also by those words, our Blessed Mother was giving his mother to all of us, we who were represented by St. John there at the foot of the cross. That through St. John, we might say, our Lord was giving his mother, sharing his mother with all of us. Devotion to our Blessed Mother is so important that St. Louis says without a devotion to her, we cannot achieve our salvation without at least some devotion to Our Lady. And the more we have, as long as it is a true devotion, the more, the easier we can live our Catholic faith and be pleasing to our Divine Lord. I was mentioning the story of this woman, a convert, who told me, so regretfully that devotion to Our Lady had been held back from her and how she, she has realized so much. And this reminds me of the importance on our part of praying for the conversion of all of those outside the Catholic Church. Now tomorrow we begin an eight-day period of prayer called the Church Unity Octave or the Chair of Unity Octave. And this practice... Uh, is indulgenced by the church to pray, especially during this period of eight days, beginning tomorrow on the Feast of St. Peter's Chair at Rome and concluding the following Monday, the 25th of January, with the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul. And this eight-day octave has a very interesting beginning because it was begun by an Anglican priest, and I believe his name was Lewis Watson. And this man was a very sincere Anglican minister, so much so that he recognized that the Pope was the true successor of St. Peter. And even as an Anglican, he would collect money, what Catholics would call Peter's pence, and send it to the Pope. And yet he was still an Anglican. The Pope at that time was St. Pius X. Now he founded in... Uh, a city name known as Graymore, New York. So it's about 45 minutes or an hour directly north of New York City along the Hudson River there. He founded a community, a religious community, uh, called the Society of the Atonement. And there were a group of priests and brothers, Anglican priests, and then a group of sisters, following the Franciscan rule and praying for unity among Christians. Now, he had been influenced by the Oxford movement, so he thought that it's okay to remain an Anglican, but here he he reverenced the Pope. Well, this devotion on his part to the papacy and his prayer, his sincerity in living the Franciscan rule, led him to realize 
that he needed to enter the Catholic Church. And it was very unique because he sought not only to be accepted into the Catholic Church, to become a member of the Church, but he wanted his society. And I don't know at that time in 1909 how many brothers and sisters there were in the Society of the Atonement. But all of them were received into the Catholic Church, and it is the only time in church history that a non-Catholic religious community was bodily received. And what I mean by that is normally they would have to individually be converted, and then they could enter a Catholic religious order. But this so-called Society of the Atonement, the entire group was received into the Catholic Church, and they were allowed to continue what they had been doing following the Franciscan rule. And again, that was in 1909. So Lewis Watson, who was an Anglican minister and therefore not a valid priest, went to a Catholic seminary and was ordained a Catholic priest. But that group there in New York promoted this eight-day octave, and it was formally approved by Pope Benedict the the 15th in later 19-teens, then maybe 1915, 16, 17, something like that, and again, indulgenced. But the point here is that we should pray for the conversion of all of those outside the Catholic Church, that they will recognize the truth and they will enter the one true fold of the Catholic Church. And this is what we would call a spiritual work of mercy. When we think of the works of mercy, we tend to think of the corporal works of mercy, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, and so forth. Those are the corporal works of mercy. But even more important are the spiritual works of mercy. And the spiritual works of mercy would contain whatever we do to relieve the spiritual needs of our neighbor. And the soul is of far greater value than the body. The body will die one day and decay. The soul will live on forever. The soul is immortal. And it should pain us that so many souls are lost. All of those human beings that die each day, how many of them go to heaven? How many to purgatory? How many souls are lost? We don't know that number. But we do know that many, many souls are lost. Our Lady at Fatima said to the children, pray and sacrifice for the conversion of sinners. So many souls go to hell because there is no one to pray and offer sacrifices for them. And this leads me to reflect briefly on the the terrible results of Vatican II, which concluded just over 50 years ago. In December 8th was the 50th anniversary of the end of Vatican II. And the devastation caused by Vatican II could never be adequately explained or enumerated. All of the souls that lost their faith, etc. But if we were to try to summarize very briefly what Vatican II was, it was this movement that promoted what's called ecumenism. And this ecumenism is getting together with non-Catholics and having joint prayer, etc., Just today, Francis, who calls himself Pope Francis, went to the synagogue in Rome, Jewish synagogue. Now, do you think that he told those Jews that they need to be converted and accept Jesus Christ, whom their prophets predicted was the Messiah, and that our Lord fulfilled every single prophecy that was made about the coming Messiah? Of course not. Because in the Vatican II church, it's just simply get along with everyone. It used to be that missionaries went to foreign country at great sacrifice and in in danger of their own lives to bring the faith to those that didn't have it. Now foreign missionaries are more social workers. There is no longer this idea of conversion. Yes, there are still conversions to the Catholic religion, but it is certainly not emphasized. We on our part should always remember that the Catholic Church alone is the true church, the one true church. We must thank God for the grace of faith that we have and desire to share that with others through our good example, our words, and especially by our prayers.
So that is the octave we begin tomorrow, but really every day. We pray for the conversion of all of those outside the true church. And let us pray that they will come to understand, especially Protestants who, who love Jesus Christ, believe in Jesus Christ, but do not have really a devotion to Our Lady, that they will come to understand who she is, that she is their mother. She is our spiritual mother. She is the mediatrix of all graces. And Our Lady is also the key. Those who pray the rosary have the grace to understand the truth in these days, in these days of darkness and confusion. Let us always remain strong in our devotion to our Blessed Mother and remember the lesson of this gospel, the miracle of Cana, which demonstrates so clearly the intercessory role of our Blessed Mother and the importance of having a deep devotion to her.